I'm delighted to be able to uh, introduce uh, our first speaker. You've you've heard him a little bit there. Um, so uh, Henk Vorbida is um, responsible for enterprise architecture at the city of Amsterdam. Um, just a, a very brief uh, uh, background on Henk. Uh, Henk's got a, a slide, I think, in which he'll give you a, a bit more information. But uh, I made a note that uh, Henk has been uh, active and working in the uh, IT industry for um, 33 years. Um, the last 20 of which has been uh, in the field of architecture. So obviously he brings a, a wealth of experience to this um, to this field. Um, the presentation, One Amsterdam, One Architecture, um, is about consolidating siloed government architectures uh, into a central source of knowledge. Um, and so with that, uh, um, Henk, let me pass over to yourself. Thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is indeed Henk Volbeda. That's the Dutch... Uh, pronunciation. Um, thank you for your kind introduction and for the uh, opportunity to share my uh, experience in the land of architecture with this audience and more specifically on the, the story of my journey over the last seven and a half years working for the local government of Amsterdam. Um, so let me introduce myself uh, uh, and let's do that in a way architects use to communicate uh, by some, by using some kind of graphical model, in this case by using a an Archimate model to depict a summary of my career so far. Um, I started uh, my career in 1981 as a teacher, a teacher of chemistry and physics, and quickly my interest grew in the use of computers. That was before Windows, even before DOS, and long before the internet. We developed the first introduction curriculum, talking to farmers about PCs, CPUs, RAM and ROM memory, rather technical, I, I'm afraid. Uh, well, to shorten the story, that triggered a career switch into the IT world. I followed a traditional path from programmer, a good old IBM 370 mainframe assembler, to analyst, to analysis and to architecture. Um, working mainly for large commercial organizations, uh, KLM, financial companies, sometimes directly and sometimes via a consulting firm. And so for the last seven and a half years for the municipality of Amsterdam. Uh, talking about my career of more than 35 years now, I would like to share, well, for the start, one observation. Interestingly, over the years, the number of IT related functions or specializations has exploded. For instance, the function of architect didn't exist in the years I worked for KLM. It was not invented. There was no such thing as an architect. And looking back, architecture was part of your job as a systems or an information analyst. Now in organizations, you can find a wide range of architects technical, infrastructure, security, solution, data, application, information, business, and or enterprise architects. And not only do they need to work together in the land of architecture, but also with lots of other professionals. That's why I think that most of the time we actually don't have so much as a technical challenge. We have organizational challenges to collaborate efficient and effectively between those specialized professionals in order to create sustainable value. Okay, let's get back on track and let's introduce Amsterdam for those of you who don't know it or who know it only by its reputation. Amsterdam is the form formal capital of the Netherlands, although the political center of the Netherlands is in The Hague. It is a city of less, is more or less 800 years old and it started as a small village around a dam in the river Amstel, as you probably could guess from its name. As a city, internationally speaking, it's not a large one. It has a population less than one million. But um, uh, in Holland, in the Netherlands, we have a relatively small scale city, town and local government system. But if you uh, take into account that neighboring municipalities are socially and economically intertwined with Amsterdam, then you could say that Amsterdam or the Amsterdam area is much larger. 
and it encompasses um, a population of more than two and a half million. Um, of course, there are some uh, facts as our standard presentations on Amsterdam. We have lots of bicycle roads, lots of museum parks. Uh, our main airport is close by, Schiphol. Um, well, let's go to enterprise architecture. And let's talk about um, the organizational landscape, because I think that is, if you don't understand the late landscape you're working in, then you have difficulties in finding your route. Um, I'm always now seven and a half years employed as architect for the CIO office. Interesting enough is that I'm not employed by the same employer. I'm talking about that later on. As the city itself, also the administrative and civil servant organization was, is, and most likely will be in constant change. An organization is never finished and there's always some maintenance, renovations, developments or innovations going on. Navigating through a constant changing landscape or organization requires oversight in order to determine the most efficient and effective route to a desired destination. So I would like to share the experience on the development of the architecture discipline in relation to understanding how the organizational landscape and its history in Amsterdam uh, works and how it has been developed. And I would like to do that along three stages or periods. Between those stages, major changes or transitions have occurred impacting the architecture function. So let's go back in time to 2013 when I joined the CIO office in Amsterdam. I really didn't join Amsterdam because there was no such thing as a sort of central entity for the uh, civil servant organization. There were more than 40 independent service departments, each with their own staff, each with their own ICT, and each with their own INT staff, with overall four, more than 4,000 applications. There was a sort of central ICT department, and CIO office was part of that. But the full landscape, the organizational landscape, it was more like a sort of holding structure with independent service departments. Architects, they worked disparate across the organization. Between, I say, 20 architects could be found working in one or supporting one or two service departments. There were enterprise architects within the CIO office. At, the time, at that time of speaking, there were four of those. Um, and within the ICT department, there were some technical architects. There was some shared way of working already. Uh, there was some thinking about how to create domain architectures. And we used uh, methods like project start architecture to enable projects uh, uh, to facilitate projects in doing the right architecture, but always architecture based within the silo of a service department. So never on the full landscape of the city. Um, the way architecture models were made, well, by using Visio most of the time or PowerPoints or whatever office tools were used. And the storage of those, what we call, what we can call art, architecture artifacts, they were stored at local file stores within those service departments. So not accessible for uh, general use. So in those years, when I entered the CIO office, I, we, or as a team, 
we started um, with a four weekly architecture meeting. So in a sort of informal way to share knowledge and to share a sort of way of working or develop a sort of shared way of working. Uh, for instance, by simply creating new templates for domain and project start architectures and to define and use a standard Archimate Physio stencil. Um, and we started to work on shared use of Archimate because Archimate is a difficult, it, it's a language um, and it looks as, like a simple language with boxes and, and circles and arrows. Uh, but when you start using it, you quickly find that it is uh, not very easy to use. So you need to, 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 um, to develop that skill area. So one of the things we use as a method is in our four weekly meeting, the, what we call the model of the month. Uh, and, we, and so one of the architects uh, had to deliver a model which was then discussed in terms of the proper use of Archimate. By that, uh, improving the Archimate modeling skills. Um, we also started improving our, Archi our architecture processes. For instance, domain architectures were sometimes made in what I, what I could, should call complete isolation. Um, of any business initiative. Um, so we started to uh, say, well, you never make a domain architecture on its own. You only make a domain architecture as part of a business information planning uh, uh, project. So architecture should always be part of a development and not a development on its own. And when I started at Amsterdam, they had a sort of two-step PSA uh, process. And well, we did a sort of lean uh, uh, process improvement and created a, a, a one-step PSA. So improvements um, on skills, shared knowledge, and some improvement on processes, but no, improvements on tooling, just simple Visio, because in my opinion, um, you shouldn't invest heavily in tooling if you haven't invested first in skills and capabilities and modeling capabilities. So the next phase, um, in the next uh, uh, phase, a large reorganization was carried out uh, beginning of 2015. Uh, all service departments were um, reorganized into five clusters. Uh, in this uh, simple picture, it's only showing three, but in reality, there were five of them. Um, and there was one central management team uh, organized uh, with sort of general directors, you could call them, and each general director was in charge of a cluster. And each cluster contained, well, say about 10 originally service departments. Um, and what was also carried out was that all the technical IT staff was moved to the central ICT service department. Uh, most of them, I must say. Uh, some departments with specific uh, IT use uh, is still part of the uh, service departments. The functional, what we call, can call the functional uh, information specialists like project managers, information managers, functional maintenance personnel, they were moved in an, what we call an information management support unit. That's the green things in the, in the, in the, in the picture. 
uh, and they support the business organizations, the yellow boxes, uh, in developing and maintaining their IT environments. So that was a big reorganization and that also had impact, of course, on the architectural landscape. Um, local data centers were uh, also dismantled and moved to a central ICT data center. And one thing was also carried out that was a very important action was to assign applications to what we call family owners. Um, and each of the family owner was given the task to rationalize his family in order to reduce the number of applications. We started in 2015 with 4, 000, more than 4,000. And in the end of 2017, there were 1,100 left. Still a lot, but a huge reduction. In the meantime, what, what did we do on the architectural uh, side? We continued our four weekly architecture meeting with now what we call cluster architects. Each uh, information management support unit, they hold now the architects, the information architects. One of the senior information architects we called cluster architect and they were gathered in the four weekly architecture meeting and we continued in harmonizing and improvement in our way of working across the organization. For instance, by creating a how-to manual for architects. So not architecture on the, on the hard content, the architecture of the application landscape itself, but on the skills, the methodology, and what I would call the way of working. We also introduced a, a, a new sort of project start architecture. We found that some projects were, well, relatively small and that creating a, a, a full scale project start architecture uh, would be time consuming, too much time consuming for such a small project. So we introduced what we call an architecture memo, uh, just enough architecture for a project so and we moved that was also an important step in the, that phase physio well it's it doesn't help you in um, the syntax checking of archie made um, so we're very glad that archie came around as an open source tool as a simple visio archie made modeling tool so we introduced that in 2015 and we started that as a as our Archimate modeling tool. Apart from Archimate, there was also another new methodology uh, being used in one of the clusters and that was a uh, demo. Demo is a uh, uh, methodology for business architecture and I included the reference uh, in this slide so you can look it up. It's not broadly used in, in Amsterdam but it is a very interesting uh, methodology if you want to uh, uh, really re-engineer an organizational. Uh, it's about transactions, responsibilities. It's not about applications or whatever. It's really about the fundamental essential organization. Uh, so it's typically something for business architects um, and business architects may find Archie made a little bit too complex, a little bit too IT. Um, so demo is, a, is, a, is an interesting methodology uh, to look into if you are into business architecture. Uh, by the way, um, Abacus is not, has some, has a sort of a demo um, meta model, but it's not uh, sufficiently, I think, uh, in in supporting the the demo language as a whole, so work has to be done uh, with evolution on that. Then we're coming to the last uh, years. Uh, the landscape didn't change so much, uh, uh, but there was one um, 
Um, next step, I would say, in further consolidation of the um, INT personnel. That was that certain IT professionals or I professionals, they were concentrated in what we call expertise resource pools. And so we have now resource pools around, for instance, project managers and information architects. And those are the colored red, purple and light green boxes. And they work for the whole organization. So they work as a resource pool and they have a resource manager and a, and a, and a manager who is now taking care of that whole resource pool. So that is an interesting uh, uh, um, a change because now all the architects, all the information architects are now in one sort of uh, team or one uh, department. And that makes it uh, a little bit easier to have the conversations about tooling, methodologies, and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. Perhaps you also notice that the dark green box, uh, and that represents the CIO office, uh, has changed because um, in around two, starting 2020, we had a new CIO, and that is one of the general directors um, of Amsterdam. So that's in the top layer, and he's now also the CIO. And the CIO staff is now part of his organization, you can say. So we are now, as a, the, the CIO is now more embedded in the general management of the civil servant organization. Well, uh, it's never finished, as I said in my introduction. Um, so speaking now, we are developing a new vision or a, vi a next vision, you could say, and a strategy for the next phase of developments in the INT domain for 2020, the second half and further. Um, and you can understand or you can, you, well, you can never predict. Uh, but if the line is, is, is followed as so far, then you can expect that the green boxes um, are more joined together. So instead of having separate information support units, there may be one organization as a supportive organization for the whole. Uh, but that, that is perhaps a presentation for next year or the year after. We've got, in the meantime, a lot of what I call eye challenges. Um, we have a broad emerging data as an asset awareness. Um, traditionally, Amsterdam, as a government organization, is a sort of administrative organization. Um, but now we are seeing a lot of innovations uh, in the IT domain, uh, developments and in um, software as a service, cloud developments. We had a lot of privacy and ethics uh, issues. Um, we have difficulties to unlock data from our systems. Um, and we have to cope with that all. With 1,100 applications, with a lot of new smart systems coming up. Um, with rapid application development in my old term, terminology, what I call uh, apps coming up. And we, had to, we have to serve that with say about 20 information architects, two enterprise architects, and a couple of IT architects. So that is a, a difficult, uh, uh, that, that is a challenge, let's say that. So, what did we do in the last three years in architecture development steps? Well, we had, of course, the formation of our expertise pool information architects. By the way, when I use that term information architects, it's not information as only data. It's around 
processes, applications, and a combination of data. That is what we call information architects. We introduced an architecture board and um, an architecture board without no architects, because I think an architecture board should be a board with some sort of uh, decision power. And that should be comprised of directors. So our architecture board is comprised of uh, directors of service units across the, the, the organization. Every cluster, you could say, has one director as a representative in the architecture board. And the CIO is the chairman. And there is one uh, added architect, and that's the enterprise architect that is added to the architecture board. But it is, it's, so it's not a, a, a meeting of architects, uh, definitely not. Uh, the architecture board functions as a advisory board to uh, a general management. Something we missed in our uh, artifacts was a project and architecture. So we created project start architectures or program architectures, uh, but we never had a sort of uh, quality check on the end of a project if the project start architecture was fully realized or what kind of deviations had taken place in the project realization phase. So we introduced that in this period. And of course, that's why in this uh, presentation, um, um, we introduced uh, a new tool because Archie is still, well, it's better than Physio, but it lacked a sort of central repository. So we started um, um, by in 2018 by a selection process, a procurement process. Uh, we're a government organization and you know, you, it is always there and you have to follow uh, procurement uh, 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 rules and legis legislation. So uh, in, 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 in commercial organization, it's rather easy to say, well, I want to have that tool or I want to have that asset and you can buy it. In government organizations in, the, in Europe, you have to be uh, open and transparent um, and you have to treat the market as a whole. So um, it is a difficult uh, uh, and time consuming uh, um, uh, process to select a tool. Uh, in the end, we, uh, we came up with uh, a buckus that uh, came out uh, of that procurement process. And we start with that tool in 2019. We use it as a, uh, a software as a service uh, uh, environment. Um, so we were quickly up and running, technically speaking. Um, and one of the things you, of course, have to do when you start with a new tool, you have to think about how are you going to use that tool. So we restarted our development of a way of working and out around, not with Archie, but a way of working in a Abacus. Uh, creating how-tos, creating a sort of Archimate legenda in our tooling. <clears throat> we have a sort of different coloring um, standard than the standard Archimate colors. They are blue, green, and blue. And I think you should use a more, um, well, you have more colors to, to, your, uh, to, to, to give more emphasis on the different uh, uh, entities in a model. And we started integrating our architectural content. Uh, they were all shattered still, um, um, and were not accessible. And that is not an easy task um, to gather uh, all the architectural artifacts created in, I, th I think, the last 10 years, and to gather that into one uh, repository and to integrate those so that is in progress and i think in reality that will take us probably quite some years um, to integrate that 
uh, because with 15 or 20 architects and a lot of projects going on, integration is something, well, there is not always time to do um, the maintenance part of your modeling. Um, and I believe in, in the presentations yesterday, there was also mentioning of uh, that you should really also consider that if you try to create a sort of knowledge base, you really should take to into account that it takes time to keep it uh, into uh, uh, in, in to, to give it a, a quality also for the coming years. And that takes time. And that is difficult when you have only got 15 or 20 architects to get that quality. Um, what we don't do yet, but what we planned for the next half year is to open up that knowledge base with the quality that it has then. So sharing by using the Abacus browser or the publisher was still investigating that. Um, and to give insight in the architecture we have, because uh, of course, uh, modeling is, is quite nicely, but it's now more like a back office activity of architects and the organization, well, they, they are not able to consume those uh, architectural models yet. So that's the next step. Um, so that is perhaps a, a good uh, moment to uh, go to in a sort of intermission, intermezzo, uh, to tell you something about our way of working uh, around a buckus. Um, we started with uh, a, a standard, the standard Archimate uh, 3 Archimate library project, which consists, of course, mainly of a, a sort of meta model, which is supplied by Evolution as a sort of start off. And we changed, uh, we, sh we, we made some minor tweaks in the meta model, like the coloring, uh, we added some attributes, uh, we defined our own viewpoints, but always within the boundary of Archimate. We don't want to change the Archimate standard or to extend it or to merge, say, BPMN with Archimate or UML or Demo or, so, or sort, of, so, sort of hybrid. We want to really to standardize as much as possible. Um, based on that uh, library project or that meta model, we started our central repository project. Uh, uh, and let's say that is our single knowledge base. Um, and for those of you who don't know uh, uh, Abacus, um, it's based on a sort of a project uh, with a meta model and a project contains an architectural collection. And one of the architectures in that architecture collection is what we call one Amsterdam, one architecture. That is our baseline, as you can, uh, can say. Uh, it is meant to be the single knowledge base. All our models, which, we fun, we, which are valuable, uh, those should be part of that architecture. But that's an, to start with, that's an empty one. Um, so when you start, you have to gather all your artifacts in the world around. So we used uh, Archie exports and the standard Archimate XML. And we use the standard import function of Abacus to import those Archimate XML files and to import those architectures in the architecture collection. And we separated them as separate architectures. And to give an indication, um, I think we imported from the history of using Archie about, I think, 50 architectures. So, the, so there are now in the repository something about 50 um, architectures coming from the previous phases. 
Um, we've also got um, published government reference architectures. They are published also by using Archimate XML and you can import them and you can include them in your own architecture as a reference architecture. Furthermore, we have a, a separate application portfolio management tool. So you can pull out a list of that and we do that by a simple query. Uh, we transfer it to an Excel and then import it into an architecture and to include that in our one Amsterdam, one architecture. Uh, and we do that by using the mechanism syncing. Uh, and I would say functionally, uh, that is mean, meaning importing, import architectures and consolidating them in the one Amsterdam, one architecture. Um, that looks something like this. You, you are uh, using the function, uh, 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 create a difference report between two architecture. In this case, uh, an import architecture and the one Amsterdam, one architecture. And it, if, and it shows you the differences between. And then you can easily say, well, uh, let's sync those elements you want to sync. And then the import is done. It, 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 it does really seem easy now, but it, we found this rather complicated. You have to really be careful uh, to use this method um, uh, to transfer uh, data from import architectures to your baseline. Um, furthermore, it only imports the connections and components. It doesn't do anything on diagrams. So you have to move diagrams from one architecture to the baseline by hand, by sort of copy paste mechanism. So that's something we probably uh, want to improve as a way of working. Um, yesterday, I saw a presentation of uh, nation, nation, nationwide, nationwide, and they had some uh, rather heavy scripting um, uh, to to accelerate uh, using Abacus. Uh, but that is, we are still amateurs, I guess, in, in the use of Abacus. So that's probably something to look into the coming years. Another interesting feature is that we uh, use uh, Evolves for development architectures. Um, the architecture is never the same. So when we start a project, we do an Evolve and then a copy is made in what we call a development architecture. And that may be for use for developing a new domain architecture or a program architecture or a project architecture. Um, so the architect uh, who is working on a new architecture is never working on the baseline. He's always working on a copy of the baseline and he's adding and changing that copy of the architecture. In the meantime, maybe updates are coming up from one from your baseline. For instance, uh, updates in the application portfolio. So you use a sync to sync the baseline with your development architecture. And when your project is finalized, you of course of course have a project end architecture, and then you sync back the new baseline. Um, and something we are working on now and or thinking, and that has to be um, before end of this year, I hope really be uh, be part of our architecture process is sharing and uh, 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 sharing that architecture information uh, by using the browser or the old product of Abacus, the publisher. Uh, but that's something uh, we have to look into. Um, another note, we also have, uh, and that's not a standard function available, but there's the export. Um, we, now we use Abacus, but as with all tools in governments or systems used in government, um, today we use Abacus and perhaps in five years we have another tool um, for the same job 
because in, in, in government, you never know what comes out of a procurement process. Um, so what we really wanted is to safeguard our knowledge. So we emphasized in our uh, um, procurement process uh, that we only want to have a tool which is able to import standard uh, architecture, XML, Archimate XML, and is, all, and is also possible to export it as, again, to safeguard or to be able to transfer your knowledge in time from one tool to another tool. So that was a major feature for us, a must have in a tool, um, um, because else you are, well, you're, you're closing your knowledge in a, in, a, in a toolbox and you can't get it out. Uh, so we, we really emphasize an Archimate and Archimate XML import and export. And of course, this is continuous development. And I think uh, we can um, learn a, a lot from uh, the other experienced uh, uh, Abacus users, for instance, in the use of scripting or visual scripting as a new feature. Um, and what are next steps? Well, continue pooling and use for architecture related data. Um, there is a lot to be found in all kinds of documents. Um, for instance, on strategy levels. Um, we have to work on uh, integration, not only horizontally, but what I could call uh, also vertically. And that is what I uh, uh, and, uh, mean by um, connect the architectural, the architecture information about processes and applications uh, to our government goals and plans. So in terms of Archimate, by um, also specifying in our models the strategy and motivation elements. And that makes, that creates added value for your management. And also by adding new landscape views, useful for strategy development and evaluation or for life cycle management. It's, it's not only detailed architectures, those are fine for architects and designers, but for management, uh, landscape views are much more useful, I think. So that is uh, one of the next steps as well. And, our, and not only share, share is a sort of passive way, but uh, specifically to create feedback loop to improve quality. So, the ability for in Abacus to, to include feedback uh, mechanisms uh, by via email. So uh, users can respond to, well, I, I, I've got a question or I, I see an error in this model. Uh, I think that is a very important uh, feature to uh, improve the quality of your knowledge base. Furthermore, Importantly, I think the tool is just a tool for not only for the modelers, but it also should accelerate uh, the, the architecture contribution in all kinds of projects. Nowadays, we have to, it takes too much time for architects to gather the information and tooling helps us to accelerate creating those models because we have a consolidated knowledge base. And I think that is a very important step. Uh, and above uh, all, improve collaboration, not only with the architecture community, um, but uh, with all other kind of stakeholders. Um, I'm a strong believer that architects are not in the middle of the universe uh, and not, are not the driving force of change. They are only part of that. Uh, a little bit humble, I should say. Uh, so not only work within the architecture community, but work also with your information management and your information security and your project management. And that is really important to, to address uh, collaboration. Um, so that brings me to my uh, the end of my 
short speech to my short presentation. And uh, I would like to use a sort of metaphor from the tangible world. In all our cities, signposts uh, like this are used to guide visitors to their destination. Or of course, by using maps or paper ones or modern digital guides. As in fact, that those are solutions to assist in finding your route in an unknown complex landscape of which you can observe only a small fragment with your own eyes. When you're standing in a street, you can only see the houses. You don't see the next street or the next area. Um, so architects should be able to offer that overview in relation to where am I and where I want to go. A tool like a Bacchus can be valuable in that, but uh, a tool is only a tool. And without skills, a knowledge base, a language or symbols that can be understood, without oversight and without an outspoken understanding of position and required destination, any tool will fail. So the route to creating architecture of added value is a difficult one. It depends on a lot of factors. Some or most of them lie outside the architecture function itself. So yes, strive for creating, strive for creating architecture value, but be aware there's no such thing as a signpost. So invest in shared and interlinked capabilities and be again, humble. We're only architects. So thank you for your presence. Peter, that is all, over to you. Okay, Hank, thank you very much. A great presentation, very informative. Um, and lots of great analogies there. And by the way, and a lovely insight into the city too. So uh, fantastic, thank you very much for that. And you know what, you, were, you must have been multitasking in some way because you seem to be answering a couple of the questions that have been coming in as well, um, which is making my job a little bit tricky now to try to, uh, to, to recap over some of these. Specifically around the rationalization, um, of applications. I think you referred to this at the very beginning. We had a question early on. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'd mentioned it being 4,000 plus to 11,000 plus. So the question was, how did you decide on um, which apps to remove? Did you have some sort of scoring approach for this? Uh, mm, it, it, well, not formally. It was left to the uh, domain areas or the information managers uh, with their uh, family owner to uh, define which application in their family portfolio should be the target application. And sometimes that was based on sort of analysis on functional and technical fit. So if an application was out of contract, then it, it, it wouldn't be a target application. If it just was uh, procured, then the chance that that should be the target application was was well uh, higher so it was not a formally uh, organized process but what uh, but it, it was carried out by some, some sort of logic based on uh, fit for purpose okay cool excellent all right well, thank you for that um, let's see okay is that is that answering the question Yes, I believe it has. And um, yeah, thank you for that, Hank. And, and indeed, I think we have to say thank you then. Um, there's a couple more questions, but we have just sort of reached our, our, our time limit, I'm afraid. So um, those other one or two questions we'll, we'll forward on and between ourselves and Hank, we can, we can answer. Um, Hank, thank you. Yes, I mean, that was, a, that was a good response to those questions there. And indeed, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, as I say, it's been um, it's been wonderful to actually hear about the work that you're doing there in Amsterdam uh, City Government, and um, yes, we we look forward to to learning learning more as that project uh, evolves uh, even further. Um, so thank you once again. Uh, thank you to everybody that's uh, been in attendance. Um, um, and as I say, thanking uh, Henk once again uh, for uh, this session. It's been great. Um, say so thank you for joining us all. We look forward to talking with you again very soon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.